So in, in the 1980s, we were spending like crazy. Anybody old enough to remember? Like the world was going to end, so just spend it anyway. That was like the idea. Um, and then the world didn't end, and we were broke. <laughs> and it was like, shit, we're broke. What do we do now? <laughs> Uh, and then the go-go 90s came, and we thought the internet was going to change the world. Once again, we were spending like drunken sailors. Uh, and then that ended, and we know how. And in the 2000s, we were using our houses as, as ATM machines. That didn't work out. So I think this time around, we're so jaded that things are that good that we know it's going to end. So we all feel awful. <laughs> It's a very cynical New Yorker point of view, but I thought I'd provide you some humor. <laughs> uh, I just killed four minutes of my presentation. Sorry about that. Uh, but I couldn't help but laugh at that. I'm like, you know, there's probably some truth to that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so quick intro. Uh, uh, so I, I started Claro about five years ago. Prior to doing that, I, I ran the global recruitment outsourcing business for ADECO. It's a brand called Partoon. Um, I have some weird hobbies. I'm a blockchain enthusiast. Anybody like blockchain? No. Don't kill me. No, I'm joking. Uh, I actually ha hold a professional certificate in blockchain for business, believe it or not, from the Linux Foundation. Uh, I got into blockchain when my identity was hacked five years ago. Uh, and uh, people stole thousands of dollars from me, so I said there's got to be a way to solve this, so I kind of got into it, and ever since uh, I've been in it, so it's kind of a weird hobby. I'm a game theorist. Anybody like game theory? <laughs> pretty cool, right? So I'm pretty weird. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> anyway, one of my favorite quotes actually comes from, uh, from Jim Barksdale, former Netscape AOL, uh, and it says, if we have data, let's look at data, and all, if all we have is our opinions, then let's just go with mine. And, and I think that's like very, very appropriate for the people analytics function because sometimes we get into like these intellectual debates about things. Uh, but I, I prefer to kind of look at data. Uh, so a little bit about Claro. Uh, I think it's kind of the only slide I'll show you about Claro. Uh, we're a platform of, of unique workforce insights. Um, and the purpose of what we do is to kind of help improve employee engagement, help retention, and uh, help companies find diverse talent faster. Uh, in a nutshell. And uh, much to, to kind of Matthew's path, I figured I was going the second day, and by this time, everything about people analytics that needs to be said has probably already been said. So I thought I would do a little bit of edutainment, which is like education and entertainment. So I kind of made up a word, called it edutainment. Uh, so uh, I kind of wanted to say kind of society has really changed over the last five years. Somebody said something yesterday that was so true, like HBR, the Harvard Business Review, all they write about is people now. It's just fascinating. It became like a people analytics magazine. It's, it's, it's amazing, right? It's like they should just rebrand it. Um, but it, it also like The Economist, like proper publications now are writing a lot about the workforce and et cetera. So I think the workforce has really become something that society has been fascinated with. It's, you know, if you do a quick Google search for you know, HR, human resources, people, there's just tens and tens of thousands of pages of information that you could find. So uh, it's a very interesting topic. And then there's also some empirical evidence uh, that I found interesting. So I'm a geek and a bit of a quant. So anybody use Google Trends at all? If you don't, do it. Like later this afternoon, you'll be addicted. So I did a, a search to say, hmm, let me look at some interesting information. So I did a search of over the last 10 years, of what people looked for online. And if you notice, the, the uh, red line is employee satisfaction. And some of you may remember that was all the rage, you know, not that long ago. It was all about employee satisfaction. And this thing, employee engagement, nobody knew what that meant. And look what happened over the last 10 years. The interest in employee satisfaction pretty much goes to zero. And the interest in employee engagement goes completely the other way. So if anybody needs evidence to talk to your leadership that employee engagement is important, just show them that. You could probably do it live in a meeting so they won't like doubt it. So it's really, really interesting. So that's kind of like an important stat. I'm going to continue down the Google Trends path because I also thought that this was interesting. So I wanted to show some analysis of interest around workforce planning and people analytics. This is the theme of the conference after all, correct? 
So if you look at the yellow line, this is the general interest in talent marketing. While it's there, it's relatively low. But if you look at workforce planning, still dominates what people look for by a significant margin. And the scale is basically 0 to 100% relative to one another, right? I think we could, we could sort of sort that out. So we see that workforce planning and people analytic interest is, is high. And while it's not growing tremendously, it's consistently high. Right, so that's kind of like really good news. And then we have problems. Then we have this thing called data privacy comes around, and, and it just about obliterates all the other interest. So suddenly, people analytics, workforce planning, employee engagement, they all go out the window. Let's now talk about data privacy. Fascinating. And we could almost figure out what that data is, no? <laughs> then it gets worse. GDPR comes around, <laughs> and all the other lines become a kaleidoscope. <laughs> you can't even tell what they are. The only thing that matters is GDPR. And as funny and entertaining as this is, this kind of tells you where the hearts and the minds are of our leaders. Because it's really fascinating, because we sometimes forget that there's macro things that are as important, if not more important to them, and while people analytics and workforce planning are important to us, they may not necessarily be important to everybody else. So I just kind of wanted to put that reminder out there. Uh, by the way, part of what I wanted to do is talk to you about data storytelling. I just did data storytelling. And it didn't take a lot of slides, and there was no writing. Right? Data storytelling is a very powerful technique that you could use in the people analytics function to tell and communicate information visually in a way that resonates with people. And so data storytelling is a tool that I would encourage you to explore if you have yet to explore that. Very basic information presented in a unique and novel way is very effective at communicating your ideas. Cool. So now I got to get like a little functional here. The other part of what I was supposed to talk about was talent market mapping. Uh, and competitive benchmarking, so I had to put a few slides in for that. So I wanted to share this with you guys. Um, I think talent market mapping is something that we use, but I bet if 100 people were stopped in the hallway, they would all give you a different answer. I don't know if there's a standardized answer for what talent market mapping is. Uh, I took a shot at developing this, given some of my interesting background. So when we talk about talent market mapping, we often refer to talent market mapping in context of recruitment, for whatever reason. Um, so that's kind of what we think. Um, and really, some of the purposes around why we do it is to um, identify you know, relevant people or suitable candidates for specific positions. We do it to see the employment situation in the current markets, whether they're locations or competitors or skills. Um, your company may be potentially considering things like succession planning or uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives or market expansion. Um, or if you wanted to develop more cost-effective inbound, outbound recruitment strategies. So typically, when we talk about talent market mapping, those are some of the why, the what's, and the how's, and the drivers behind that. And then when we talk about competitive benchmarking, interestingly enough, we use this in a different context, but it's kind of the same thing. When we talk about competitive benchmarking, often the context is in a non-recruiting sort of manner. Um, and for example, your company may be looking at making potential talent decisions, but it chooses not to until it has a deeper understanding of the competitive talent market. Um, or it's to either validate or maybe invalidate certain hypotheses that you may have. Um, compare your company with others in order to see like, are my programs working relative to my peers? Like one of the things that I struggled with is like, how do you define good? It's like very hard. You need a frame of reference uh, to do that. Um, and then, you know, to sort of better understand like how you compare with your peers. So this is sort of the context in which competitive benchmarking is almost used. And while the tasks are similar, the audience and I what I call the consumers of that information are different. So we have to frame it a little bit differently, right? The only problem is, is the companies aren't readily sharing this kind of information. So how do you do that? Can't just like knock on your competitor's door and say, hey, can you 
just share this information with me so I can see how I compare with you. So while the theory is actually a really good theory, the execution of this theory becomes much more complicated. Um, so what we decided to do, and a number of others are endeavoring to do as well, so it's really not unique, is that to leverage public data, or data that's available in the public domain, to answer some of these questions and to do data storytelling. And I had to throw in the ghost because I have a teenage daughter. So <laughs> that was a requirement. She made a bet with me that I couldn't figure out how to put a ghost in a presentation, and I found the slide. <laughs> she does not get this week's allowance. <laughs> Uh, okay, so forgive me for the, 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 the very small dots and et cetera, but this is an example that I wanted to share with you. There's actually one example I was going to give you that's a, a storyline, and I, I may be running short on time, so I'm going to go quick. But, you know, for example, let's say you wanted to market map veterans that work for Google, Facebook, and Intel. You could actually use public data and just plot this information and look at little blips. And everybody could figure out that purple is probably Intel because they do a lot of work in the semiconductor industry, which happens to be done in Israel. So it's very interesting. I know it's very small and it's very far, but trust me, it's an interesting data point. And then you could basically peel layers back. So with one slide, you could come to an executive and go, huh, here's where our competitors are. Data storytelling, one slide, visual, very, very simple. Um, just to go down that theme, you know, where do they go to school and what kind of skills do they have? Like, let's say you wanted to hire military veterans, you could see that they also got education somewhere other than the military. Maybe we could go and recruit them there. Things of that nature. So again, visual data storytelling, simple information. Uh, this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, case. Um, a company felt that they were laggards in diversity, that, that the market was far ahead of them and all their competitors were killing them, and the executives were very down in HR leadership. It turns out that after they did the study, they were the best of the bunch. Right? And again, visual data storytelling, as opposed to say, take my word for it, you acquire the data, you aggregate the data, you do the competitive benchmark, and you see at the end of the day, we're not so bad. Um, things of that nature. The case study I was going to give you is actually a really interesting one. Um, a company had this hypothesis, Silicon Valley, I apologize, but Silicon Valley, they felt that everybody was leaving them to go to work at blockchain companies. This is like a thing now in the US. If you're in Boston, New York, and Silicon Valley, blockchain is eating the world. So everybody's leaving by the droves, they work for blockchain. They, took a, a sample of people that resigned over the past six months. It was like 260 people, something like that. Um, and they did an analysis, and it turns out that like around 6% of the people actually went to work at blockchain companies. But more than 30 started their own companies. And what they realized was their biggest threat was not blockchain, but entrepreneurship. And imagine they were about to spend millions of dollars to improve this problem, and they would have been improving the wrong problem. The problem that they should have been improving is how do we create more of an entrepreneurial culture in the company? So they decided to create incubator style for projects to give people more of that, that entrepreneurial feel like the work that I do has meaning. Uh, and this could have been like a huge miss, not just financially, but also like they wouldn't have actually solved the problem. Um, so interesting kinds of things that, that you could do. Um, so clearly we're biased, so that's a disclaimer. Uh, but we believe that, that you can't really have a holistic people analytics um, function or strategy unless you're leveraging not only internal HR data, but also external data that's available uh, in the public domain. And I'll end there and open up for any questions. Thank you, Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it.